Today we're talking about the ISO 9001, ISO 14001, ISO 45001 monitoring and measurement provisions and how that works to track performance in your organisation. Welcome everybody to the best practice certification webinar on tracking clear pictures of performance in your organisation. It's a, great organi it's, a, it's a great webinar we've got planned for you today, uh, very dynamic, um, there's going to be lots going on. So today it's all about how we can pull together performance, monitoring and measurement, objectives and targets in your management system and improve the performance of your organisation, giving ourselves a clear picture. My name is Kobe Simmet, I am representing best practice today. There's no slide deck today, we're, going to, uh, we're changing it up a gear. We've had some success with a slightly different format. I've got the whiteboard here. I've got my pen. I'll just quickly grab that. Um, special thanks to Jack, uh, who is here with me in the studio, and our team. Uh, I think we've got Elise and Sam on the live chat, uh, and that's all happening out in the office. And um, so if you need any information or if you've got any questions as we go, then shout out. I've got my iPhone here beside me. Uh, and that is for questions. So if there are any questions, uh, I would love you to be asking questions. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and send me an email message. Um, so I'm here to help you unblock any blockages or issues that you've got with development of your management systems and then we can, uh, we can monitor what's going on. In fact, Jack has also just brought up the live chat um, so we'll be able to see what's, uh, what's going on there. Okay, let's get into it. So the first thing I just wanted to quickly talk about is everything that's around me up here on the screen above me, and that's the connect with us. Lots happening here at Best Practice with YouTube videos every week. What we're passionate about here at Best Practice is creating organizations that are growth focused, improving their profits, improving their efficiencies, uh, improving their organizations, uh, improving safety, improving environmental sustainability, improving data and cyber security. So data security and cyber security. So it's all about, you know, framed up in risk management. We're very passionate about helping your organization and we get, you know, we, we, we do feel a great sense of pride when we see you guys improve and we like to hear about those improvements. So everything that we're doing here is all about helping your organization to improve, you to improve, but your organization to improve so that your organization is a great place to work. It's a good organization to invest in um, and, and equally a great place to uh, have fun every day. So that's our why, that's why we do this, that's why so much of this content is for free. Um, but more importantly, there is also some stuff we sell. And I'm gonna ask a favor of you guys as we get through this presentation. So today we're here to talk about um, improvement and we're here to talk about KPIs and we're here to frame that up. So what I'm gonna do is get straight into it and I'm gonna talk here quickly on the whiteboard. Now, Jack, can you throw me that blue the blue rag there behind you so that I've got that to, um, to wipe off what we're doing. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna put this in my back pocket. So Jack's just gonna quickly zoom in on the whiteboard. I wanna frame this up. We know about the um, cycle of continual improvement that, that we talk about. So we've got, just quickly, we've got plan. Then we've got do, we've got check, and we've got Act. I just want to apologize for any background noise. Um, we've got a contractor in the kitchen, which is the other side of this wall beside the studio. Our kitchen flooded this morning and yesterday, so the contractor is fixing the, uh, the kitchen sink that's, that's flooding. Um, so I apologize for any of that noise, but he's just fixing that for us right now. So we talk about plan, do, check, and act, and that is the cycle of continual improvement. So. I just wanted to spend this webinar giving you some really high level summary of, you know, I would hope that I could speak to you for two days on this subject, but we've only got uh, just under an hour to talk about it. In this framework, the first question I'll ask is, well, where do we start? So if you were starting an organization or when the organization you work for or own or participate in, when they started, where did you start? And I'll often just quickly point out that we started at doing. We often just, you know, we start doing. We, you know, we, we start either doing the job that we did and the organization sort of, you know, starts off the back of that. We, we you know, we, we stop doing our job and we go and start a company doing something or the, or the founder of our company went and just started doing something. Often, there's not a lot of planning involved. It's just, we saw an opportunity and 
And you know, informally seeing the opportunity could be a bit of a plan, and then we obviously move across to doing. So I actually argue that the cycle starts with do, check, act, plan. So it's not plan, do, check, act, it's do, check, act, plan. And that's something I've been saying for the last 15 years. We just get in and we do stuff. We, f we try and figure it out. And then we go, holy shit, that didn't work. And so, you know, the checking might be, it, it's more like we made mistakes and we're trying to fix the mistakes. And so, we, the, you know, we're, so the original cycle of continual improvement was do stuff, make mistakes, oh, we better fix those mistakes. And so that's typically what's happening in organizations every day. We're making mistakes and the standard to bring in some terminology talks about corrective action or over the years in each of the international standards and business improvement we've talked about corrective action. So we act on that and we fix it. And so I'm just going to write over here, fix it. But what we're doing, we often do as humans, is we short circuit that process. We fixed it, you know, I, I was walking along, my shoelaces came undone and I bent down and I retied my shoelaces and I kept walking. And so I noticed uh, my shoelaces are undone, just as an example. Now there's a good chance that if my shoelaces come undone again, I'll probably trip over my shoelaces. But we fixed it and my shoelaces, shoelaces kept coming undone. So is there a problem in your organization that keeps happening? Because I would argue that you're following this do checked, you know, do, it's not check, it's mistake. Do mistake fix, do mistake fix, instead of do check act plan, if that makes sense. And it's this short circuit that we're spending so much time here at Best Practice trying to help you guys take this extra step to do this thing called preventative. Action. Now, that's not the word I would use in everyday life but it's the thread through this industry of corrective or fix it action versus how do we actually prevent it happening again? Or how do we, if we identify it, prevent it happening in the future, if that makes sense. So remember, you've got the opportunity to ask questions. My iPhone is right here if you want to send me a question for, and I'll answer it live for you via in-mail uh, on LinkedIn or via the live chat facility on our website. So if you want to ask me questions, I'm asking you questions, or if you want to make a comment, please go ahead and do that. You can click the button at the top. If you're viewing it in the email, if you're viewing video via the email, you can click that button and take you across to YouTube. You can comment beside the, uh, the live stream on YouTube as well. So please do that if you've got questions. I'm going to ask you questions. If you feel compelled to answer them, uh, or if you've got a question, please ask. So, What's happening in this cycle, it, it's not plan, do, check, act. That's business as imagined. It's not actually what happens in your organization every day. It doesn't happen in ours. Like, you know, we try to have a quality system and we try to have an improvement system here at Best Practice, but we're still humans and we still make mistakes. And even though I have to campaign it every single day, we still do it. And so we do stuff, we make mistakes, and we fix them. And we keep short-circuiting this preventative step. So, what this webinar was all about was how do we improve our performance. I think it's important to understand that we want to be working in this space, in this acting space, and this planning space. Very difficult to make a plan if we don't know what's going on. And that was where, that's what prompted me to, um, you know, to, to come up with the topic for this webinar about getting a clear picture of your organization's performance. How do you get a clear picture of your organization's performance. So, we start framing that up and have a think about what that looks like. Now, I've got a process to do that. So, there are, if I just call it for, for the benefit of everybody, let's just call it a company or an organization. And I'm just going to write org. There we are. So, with in the context of the international standards at the moment, we talk about this risk-based thinking. And there's lots of videos on our YouTube channel about risk-based thinking. So after the webinar, you can go and watch, you know, they're three and five minutes long. I talk about risk-based thinking. But the context of this webinar is how do we get a clear picture of our organization's performance? So 
there are some steps that I'll quickly move through and then we'll talk about um, how we start to present that. But we've got to think about the organisation and we've got to think about all the things that are coming into the organisation. I'm just going to draw a horizon line here. So we've got safety. We've got customers. We've got the environment. We've got cyber threats or cyber security or information security. We've got financial. Um, we've got um, all the other laws, if you like, government. Government laws, you know, that don't fit into that. We've got all of these areas of threat or risk, if you like. So we've been encouraging people to do a SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So the question is, if we've got all of these stakeholders or all of these areas of risk or information out there in the marketplace around us, in the environment in which we operate, the corporate environment or the government environment or the society environment around us, we've got all these things that are going to start to impact us. Now, the question would be, well, what area of performance would you like a clear picture of? So Jack's going to do quickly do a Google search. Uh, leave me on the screen and quickly do a Google search and we'll have a look for, can you Google search profit and loss statement? And we'll see what we can get from a, um, from a Google search of a profit and loss statement. So if you want to get a picture of your, a clear picture of your organization's performance, we would do a profit and loss report. So what we're starting to talk about is, if you like, risks up here, and then below this line we're talking about performance reports. Now, we're all doing lots and lots of reports every day and we're asking for reports and people are doing reports and taking time and getting data and all that sort of stuff. The context of this webinar is how do we get a clear picture of our organization's performance, and I'll come to that. But what I want you guys to be thinking about is this concept of a SWOT. Have you completed a SWOT? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Have you captured your risks and have you had your risk-based thinking? And more importantly, how often do you do that? So what's the frequency? Now, you can choose your frequency, but if you want my advice, I think quarterly. From a corporate organizational perspective, revisiting and revising this process every quarter so it falls into line with um, it falls into line with your um, financial reporting process is that you do this quarterly and this would be in the previous um, whiteboard example that I gave you the planning aspect that often gets missed that we do all of our financial quarterly but this stuff gets left to somebody in the organization to just do when they get round to it it doesn't there's no robust if I look across all of our clients, there's been no robust observation that there's consistent you know, threat, risk, uh, SWOT analysis on a quarterly basis in some sort of quarterly executive strategy type session. So frequency, I'm going to say quarterly. So four times per year. Sorry for my writing, but four times per year. If you think four times is, per is, four times is too many, Great, but I'm going to keep campaigning and advocating on all of our social media channels and everything that I do for the next, you know, however long until somebody knocks me off my perch. That four times is the benchmark. I think you should do it more often than that. I think probably six times a year you would get the most or the highest level of effectiveness in terms of the constant evaluation of performance. Six times a year in an organization because there's a bit of work involved, but four times is the benchmark. If you're doing it once a year, where you're looking at, say, management review once a year, it's not enough, and I will tell you that now. It's not enough to be effective in contributing to an improvement in the performance of your organization. Your external auditor may accept that you've done management review and you've done it once a year, but I guarantee you that once a year is not enough to actually contribute to improving your organization and improving your organization's performance. So four times a year is the benchmark. So everything I'm about to talk about 
and what we look at and what we report on and, and getting a clear picture of our organization's performance, I'm expecting you to do it at least four times a year from a management systems perspective. Okay, so rant over and apologize for that. So we're looking at this, this process here where we're identifying these areas, these risks, and sometimes if you do it four times a year, you might say, well, you know, one of the meetings we focused on customers, one we focused on cybersecurity, the next meeting we sort of focused on environment sustainability and a little bit of customers and then environment sustainability and a bit of safety, probably looking at OHS and safety almost every meeting. And so over a year, because you're doing it four times, you're going to get a balanced approach to it. If you only do it once a year, something will burden the rest of this and the other topics won't get enough airtime or attention in those meetings. So quarterly is my benchmark uh, and potentially six times uh, a, a year would be great. What happens then with this question mark is what do we want to know? And that is probably the best question out of that. Now regarding these potential stakeholders or the representatives of these areas, you can substitute this we for the word they. So what do they want to know? And my observation across, you know, here at Best Practice we're doing, you know, somewhere between two and three thousand assessments per year. We're seeing that this is a big weakness. The biggest weakness for my whole career, for the last 15 years of doing assessments of organisations, I constantly see all of this attention to writing documents and writing policy and writing procedure, no one's looking at how you guys are going. And then you're wondering why stuff goes wrong and you're wondering why you make mistakes. So what gets watched gets managed, if that makes sense. So let's now start talking about this clear picture and how we get there. Okay. If you've got any questions, you've got all those places to make comments, LinkedIn, YouTube, you can do that all now. This is live, so ask those questions. No support here, this is all me. Just don't know. Whiteboard's breaking. I don't know what that was. Someone fell off the back. Alright, okay. So, the clear picture of an organization's performance. So, what promises have you made? And that's the starting point. And I want to start with the organization's promises. What promises is the organization making to the marketplace? The marketplace is made up of customers. We'll put them over here. Uh, there's staff, so OHS. Uh, in the marketplace, there's also, say, cybersecurity and data. So uh, this week, Facebook's been under the spotlight for um, the, uh, the open back door to all of their data. Uh, environment. And of course, we should put somewhere there, uh, let's leave it to last, because profit always comes last, is financial. So what promises have you made from a customer's perspective? Can we see that? Is that still on the screen? Is it big enough for everybody? Yep. So we've got customers. Now there are actual promises and implied promises. Um, uh, really interesting, someone purchased a course, so we've got our online training courses that we sell, um, and we had a customer purchase an uh, online training course in quality assurance this morning, and I had a look at uh, the website of the company that that person works for, and they make a um, a special piece of equipment that's used in the construction industry uh, from and they're from Canada so the uh, you might be watching and you might know who I'm talking about um, really interesting organization that makes uh, some very specific equipment in the construction industry so that that company is really interesting and he's purchased this course he's he's, um, he's doing watching all the videos online it's absolutely fantastic but when I went and had a look at their website what I discovered was some really cool stuff about what they promise in terms of actual they promise, they've got all their products and their products are made, they custom make some stuff and then they've got other stuff that's in, you know, it's, it's, they've got stock available in their warehouse and they can deliver it. 
So there are some actual promises that they make. The product's already made. So they're making promises around the date that they're going to be able to deliver it. So the supply time. They're making promises around the cost or the price for the product. They're making promises around the quantity of those products that are available to their customer. But there's these implied promises. And there's all the implied promises around that the product will work. Uh, that it's the right size, that it meets industry standards, that it's safe to use, that it's environmentally friendly. Those are all the implied promises. And so as we start to ask the question, you know, what promises have you made? Then we can start to look at what those things are. And that's where we come to this next question around, well, how do we measure, this is about getting a clear picture of your organization's performance, how do we measure what, you know, what, that, that we've, that we've, delivered the promise, if that makes sense. So we can measure, you know, over here in actual, we can measure time, we can measure dollars, we can measure units, you know, and it might be the number of units on back order. You know, if there's units on back order, we haven't met our promise to be able to supply our product to our customer. Implied promises is lots of the quality standard type stuff. You know, it might be, um, you know, uh, non-conformances or defects internally of our product. It could be, you know, we could be measuring complaints. There are all the sorts of areas that, or the KPIs that we can start to say, have we delivered the promise we made? The promise we made to our customer. And that's, I'm just giving you the filter. It's only a one hour webinar. It's running really quickly. I'm just giving the filter that I use every day to start to frame up what KPIs and performance improvement would look like. From an oh &S perspective, we can look at some of the simple stuff. You know, we can look at injuries. But one person might say to me, I thought the objective of oh &S management was that we wouldn't have injuries. And so what might be some of the pre-work things or the, the lead indicators that we could ask? around injuries, then okay, so we can report hazards. We can report, we can report um, number of people exposed. And so as we're starting to think about that, what promises have we made to our staff around safety? And how do we know that we're delivering that promise? And that's, it's really that question that's going to give you the best result in terms of starting to get a clear picture of your organization's performance. Not, we're going to measure this and report this because we've been asked to. It's think about the promises. And, and this gives me the opportunity to introduce the part of your management system that captures your promise, and that's your policy. And I often see that people miss the link between what our policy says and why the policy is important, because people write them, but they don't acknowledge the fact that the policy is the leadership or the CEO giving the commitment to how we're actually gonna, you know, what, what we want to achieve, if that makes sense. So have a think about what promises you made from a safety perspective. Now you can start to talk about cybersecurity. And what promises are we making there? Or, or information security management, if you like. What data do we have? What promises have we made? What promises have we made internally? What, what implied promises are there that we're making as an organization? Um, and so start to think about those promises in terms of the context of cybersecurity. What information do we have? Do we have credit card details? Uh, you know, do we have banking details of people, staff's personal information, personal details on our customers, uh, intellectual property, commercial incompetence, designs, trademarks, all that stuff that is part of your commercial intellectual property in your organization. And what implied promises are there around protecting that, securing it, um, ensuring it doesn't get the data doesn't get damaged? Because you could accidentally damage the data. You know, we've all accidentally deleted something that we shouldn't have. So, and so um, our contract is making some noise and everyone's worried about the noise. So um, it's not affecting the audio, is it, Jack? It's okay. So, um, so from a cybersecurity and information perspective, what information do we have? How do we protect it? But more importantly, what promises did we make? Environmentally, what environmental promises have we made in the marketplace? And from a finance perspective, what information? 
half, sorry, what promises have we made to our shareholders, to our stakeholders, to our leadership team, to our staff, all that sort of stuff. Okay, so from that perspective, we're starting to get a good understanding of how we can frame up that clear picture of our organization's performance. Now's the time to start asking questions because I've almost finished my rant and I just want to finish with what we can, how we can all pull this together. Now, here in the best practice office, if you watch some of our other videos, you will see our dashboard. And I guess the final prompt for me covering this topic in this particular webinar was something that I've been closing training course or finishing training courses and presentations with for, for almost 20 years now. How do you get a clear picture of your organization's performance? And so if we've got, let me just get rid of this. If we've got this, we can start to look at reports and we can start to say, let's frame up our dashboard, if you like. <clears throat> so here at Best Practice, we've got marketing, we've got sales, we've got ops, okay. we've got finance. Okay. All good? Yeah. Too small? No, it's the uh, focus of the camera. Right, okay, it's got moving. Um, we've got um, HR, oh &S, and environment. And under that, I've got a graph. And that's how my dashboard's framed up. And the graph's got performance tracking. And those are our, what we call our, these are our divisions of the business and they're the first line of graphs on our dashboard is our gross divisional statistic. And then below that, we've got sub graphs that are all contributing to performance of that particular part of the business. And that's what basically what our format looks like or our template if you like, in all the parts of the business. Now what it allows me to do and I'll keep filling it in. That's what the pages look like. What it allows me to do as the leader of this particular business is look at the different areas of the business that are affecting each other. Like we might go really well on environmental performance, but it might actually affect our profit. Our profit might go down, for example. Uh, our OHS performance, you know, our injuries might go up. And, uh, and when our injuries go up, I know that our profit goes down because we stop work and we do the debriefing and all that sort of stuff. So preventative strategies on OHS over here, sorry, OHS over here is, you know, if we're in identifying issues and correcting issues, the more of that we do, the more we prevent incidents occurring and incidents affect us because our operations stop. And that might be, that's something that's common across construction, manufacturing, uh, heavy industries and so the more preventative activity you can do in an OHS perspective then you can you can look at a sustainable forecast of your performance and I can talk lots about different projects uh, that I've done over the years with organizations you know we looked at one organization where we did 16,000 hazard identifications in a 16 month period on a big mine site and we knew that when the average hazard identification dropped below 2.4 hazards identified per person per shift that um, that we had you know two to three week periods where we didn't have any incidents and so production could ramp up and we could be very profitable so when we had good attention to safety and high levels of safety compliance we were very profitable and so you can start to get a clear picture of how your organization's tracking and how OHS affects profit how environmental affects profit you know, how sales affect all that stuff. Because, you know, at the end of the day, organizations are run on the, on the, you know, they're predicated on the fact that they're there to make money. I didn't say make profit because, you know, you might be in the not-for-profit sector, but it's, we're, we're, we're talking business here. So we are talking money. 
and it's very important to understand what's going on in the financial part of the business and how the other areas of performance affect that, particularly if there are financial targets for the organisation in terms of sales and profit and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, a business that's not profitable is not good for staff because businesses then have to restructure, people lose their jobs, all that sort of stuff. So we've got to think about that. But here at Best Practice, we look at marketing and our leads. We know we've got to get, you know, three times more leads than sales, so it's three to one. Uh, then, you know, we've got ops, so we've got the work that we need to do over there. You know, one, you know, one sale might be 10 days, and so we know for every sale we've got 10 days worth of work. You know, that sort of stuff. We know that we'll make 20% profit, you know, on a, on a uh, well, that's our target. You know, HR is about smiley, happy people. OHNS is about safe people. And environment's about, you know, improving, improving the environment and looking after the trees. Um, it's not all of what it's about, but uh, it's something, to, something important to consider. So getting a clear picture of your organization's performance comes back to that concept of, you know, what are the promises we're making? What are the marketing promises, the sales promises, the operations promises, the financial, HR, OHS, environmental? What are we making about, you know, the promise we're making to our customer? You know, our staff, you know, the shareholders. Um, you know, the regulators, you know, the community, and each of the sub-stakeholders that are part of that process. This webinar is not about stakeholders, but it's important to understand what are the promises that we're making, and then what would they ask us to measure? What are they concerned about? Like, lots of people say, well, what KPIs should I use? What should I put on my graphs? It's like, well, why don't you ask them? Like, go to a customer and just say what's really important to you. Okay, I'll do it right now, I'll do it. we'll do a bit of a case study. So Jack, here at Best Practice, what a, what's the most important thing for you? Like, what promise do I make you that is very important? Um, Jack's in the zone, by the way. <laughs> yep. In terms of Best Practice as a whole, or my Yeah, area? you, you, like, you know, what are the things that you want to get out of working here? I want to learn how to run a business. Yep. So Jack wants to learn how to run a business. He's in the hot seat. Yep. Um, how to improve the things I do. Yep. So our marketing outlets. Yep. Perfect. YouTube, social media. So, so for Jack, as a leader, I might be saying over here in HR, I might be measuring hours of training. So Jack wants to learn. I heard learn, learn, learn in three different areas. So the numbers of hours of training per week. That is the promise, the implied promise I'm making to my staff. They come here to best practice because we're growing, we're improving. And so to get my clear picture of that and that I'm delivering that promise, we might measure numbers of hours of training delivered per week. And that's really interesting because that's tracking and, it, and you get very honest with yourself. It's very easy to not consolidate and track that stuff. But when you track it, you go, okay, how many hours should we be doing? You know, are we doing too many? Are we not doing enough? So there's lots of things like that that are happening in organizations that are not getting tracked. And you might start to feel a little bit violated because you're being vulnerable, vulnerable about this. I'm not saying that you show the world this report. This is all about getting a clear picture of your performance so you can improve it. And so it's, there's, it's no different to you know, uh, a, a sprinter running at the Olympics, like someone like Usain Bolt. He's only going to know how well he did by measuring his performance. And high-performance athletes, high-performance individuals, they measure and track their performance and they keep changing it. I know here at Best Practice, I can go out and I can show you those graphs that are on the wall. They're very different to what they were 12 months ago. And in fact, I'm standing here presenting to you, our COO is only about five meters away talking to our office manager working out what changes to the performance tracking that can happen here at Best Practice to get a clearer, even clearer picture of our performance and improve our performance. And one of the things we do here at Best Practice is best practice assessments. We do certification for ISO standards. Uh, if you're an organization that has certification to ISO standards um, and, and, you, and you would like to explore that with us, um, that's something we can definitely do. Now he is, Greg over there, our COO, is starting to assess the numbers of hours that it takes for us to issue a report. 
So we'll go and do a best practice assessment for ISO 9001 or ISO 14001 or ISO 45001 and we've got our certificates, we issue the certificate, so you know part of this business is we're a certification body. He is analysing, we've been tracking how many audit reports we issue in a seven day period and he said well wouldn't it be more important because the customers want their reports quickly, how many reports are overdue? And we say, we promise to the market that we issue our audit reports within 24 hours. Now I know that that doesn't happen. Like I know that audit reports can take five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 21 days. So Greg is like, we need to improve that. That's an important promise that we make in the marketplace that we're very quick to respond, um, you know, and we're very, you know, very, you know, efficient in what we're doing, but the statistic we've been reporting doesn't help us to improve our performance. So we're changing it. We are starting to track numbers of hours of training per month to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of all of our team members. And, and Greg and I, this morning in a meeting, were talking about could we have, um, could we run some training on leadership and influence with everybody in our business? Because we are leaders, we are an advisory organization where we're, you know, we're like, we are business coaches. Um, and we have assessors and we do this sort of stuff online. And so Greg and I were talking this morning about could we have, um, <clears throat> you know, we can, we, you know, we start running a program where we're, we're training everybody in the business on improving their questioning technique and improving their abil ability to influence via good quality uh, questions and, and getting value out of people and inspiring people and motivating people. And so that's what you'll notice about me is that's what I'm constantly working on. My own professional development is my ability to, my, you know, I want to be more influential because I want you guys to have a better life. I want your organizations to improve. And so I'm the training I do, you know, I don't stop. I don't have an off button. And the stuff I do on the weekends and the stuff I do early mornings and late nights, I'm looking at how I can be more influential, more inspiring to help you guys improve your life. Help you guys, you know, cut the corners and find the quick tips and tricks to get you motivated and get you, look at, I won't say it doesn't take work, like I'm asking you guys to work hard, but while you're working hard, I don't want you to be working inefficiently. I want you to be improving and growing, and that's the sort of stuff that we're doing. It's why we have the training academy, it's why we have best practice, it's why we call best practice. That's what it's all about here. So that's what this is all about. It's about constantly looking at this and framing this up. Now for me, I like to see these pieces of paper up on the wall in our office. But lots of people here, like Woodsy, you might have seen him in the vlog, he wants to do this electronically. He wants a projector, he wants to project the graphs up on the wall. Whatever it is that you need to show a number so that you can go, how can I improve that number? So when you get out of bed in the morning, you go, how can I improve our profit? How can I improve OHS? How can I have less injuries, incidents? How can we be more environmentally friendly? Whatever you're passionate about in your organization, your performance, it's really important to have you know, the scales. Like, if you want to lose weight, get on the scales every morning and go, what can I do today to actually pull myself down, you know, to my target weight? Or, or if you want to go running and you want to run a particular track on a particular time, or you, or you want to, you got a financial target for your life, or, or any of that sort of stuff, set yourself a number, and, and that comes back to goals. I'll do another webinar where we talk about objectives and targets and goals, but this one was all about, let's just get, let's just start looking at our performance. Later on down the track, we can put objectives. We can say, we want to, there's our objective. It's a dot on a graph. You know, here's our line here. We want to get this performance up over this line. You know, we want to have, we got 20, you know, 20 percent's our target profit, but we're only doing 5 percent. So we want to get, we want to get over that level. We can talk about goals and objectives and targets later on. Most important thing, start looking at how you're tracking and start now, like right now. Don't wait you know, it's, and that's probably the, the resounding theme in my life is I just get in and I do it right now. And so, yes, okay, I don't always get it right, but at least I start and perfect practice makes perfect. So I'll quote one of my coaches, my kayaking coach, Dean Gardner. He said to me about 10 years ago, he said, Kobe, the only way to do this is do it without thinking. So do this without thinking and perfect practice makes perfect. Okay, that's the end of my rant. How many questions have we got? Got a few. Hello everybody, how is everybody doing? Okay, what do we got? So I've got a screen here, so I'll just answer that. Um, KPI for sales and engineering. G'day Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Barrett, KPI for sales and engineering. 
Um, my sales guys, we look at um, a couple of things. So, th what's the objective of sales from a, from a KPI perspective is, my view is to build trust and confidence in your counterparty, so your customer if you like. So build trust and confidence. So the KPIs here at Best Practice relate to you know, lead indicators of how we build trust and how we build confidence. Confidence comes from having all of the right information and, and feeling good, because customers make a decision based on confidence. They don't make a decision based on numbers, numbers make them feel confident. So how will you make a customer feel more confident? What things would you do to make a customer feel confident? And that will start to give you the numbers. Here at Best Practice, the number of hours physically spent face to face with a customer, when it's low, we have a low strike rate in sales, and when the time is high, we have a high strike rate. I know that if we spend more time with a customer in face-to-face -face meeting and the length of the face-to-face -face meeting, we build great friendships, we build great relationships, the customers feel confident, they feel confident to ask us questions and things that concern them and to be open and, and insightful around, you know, we can have an open relationship where we can really help them, like they, can, they, they feel comfortable being vulnerable. So KPIs for sales uh, recognizing here at best practice that we have this split between marketing and sales. So there's lead generation activities and then sales activity. Our sales team here, we track time spent with customers. Uh, so t numbers of emails, numbers of meetings, numbers of phone calls, numbers of follow up activity. And we also know that it takes about seven to nine touch points for us to close you know, a certification deal. So for us, how many touch points? So What's the app, so for your sales team, Jeffrey, what's the average number of touch points per customer? And then set a target. So our target's seven. Seven touch points per customer. We automate some of that with automated emails. Uh, we send out magazines, our beautiful magazine certified. I think there's one here on the shelf. So that's one of our touch points. That's a sales activity for us. Issue three will be out next week. Look for that online on the website if you're not here in Australia. If you're on our database, or you'd like to be, if you'd like to receive a glossy copy of issue three, it's free, free magazine, um, send me an email message on LinkedIn and I'll add you and we'll post it to you anywhere in the world. Uh, that's what Certified's all about. Um, that's a touch point. We measure the number of touch points per customer. Um, so those are lead indicators to give you a clear picture of performance. Obviously with sales, it's all about getting invoices out to customers. So we have recently in the last month improved how we track sales by tracking every week the actual dollar value of invoices, or, or you know, or, or, or it, well, for us, it's, a, it's an invoice that goes to a customer and then the customer pays the invoice. So we have always tracked cash collected from customers and revenue, you know, cash revenue as a, crit as a crystal point. But now what we're doing is we know that we need to send out invoices. And so for us, we monitor and report every week the number of invoices and that's a sales that's a sales number. And then we look at the lead indicators that give us an indicator of how we will get to that, uh, we will get to that sales number. Um, your other one was engineering. For, your engineer, for the engineering part of your business, there's gonna be implied promises. So there's tolerances and design and all that sort of stuff. I want you to stop worrying too much about that. I want you to ask the question around your engineering part of your organization. Project management and engineering is all about time, cost, and quality. So ask your customer, what's their expectation with regards to time? What's their expectation with regards to cost? And then start to look at what can you track in your organization in terms of time to ensure that you meet the customer's or the agreed time, because the customer's always gonna want it faster than you can deliver it, but how do you have that conversation in your sales process in terms of time for your customer? Uh, and then cost and cost management and margin management and profit, so your cost of goods sold, if you like. So cost of goods sold is a really interesting area to be looking at in engineering. Um, and then quality. So what's the level of quality and what are all the aspects of quality that are important for the customer? Not for you internally, not for the, the nerds in the lab. What's important from a quality perspective from the customer? How long do they want it to last for? What's its purpose? What's its task? What does that thing need to do from an engineering perspective? It could be engineering designs on paper or mechanical, you know, I'm only thinking engineering because my brother has an engineering workshop. 
So that's sort of what's in my mind at the moment. But have a think about what's important for your customer and what would you track and measure. If you were a customer and you came and the customer came and sat in the middle of your organization, what would they be worried about? And if you don't know, get one, grab a customer and say, we'd like to work, we'd like to improve how we serve you. Would you mind coming in to our organization and maybe doing an audit or having a meeting with us and telling what you're really telling us what you're really worried about? Uh, thanks for your question, um, Jeffrey. Uh, if you would like to send me a message on LinkedIn, I'm going to stay around after this webinar and answer some more questions. Happy to have a um, like message backwards and forwards if you've got more questions. Happy to help you. That's what I'm here for. Um, who else have we got? Um, Vinod Kumar, structuring and elaboration. So, uh, more on SWOT analysis. You want some more on SWOT analysis? Um, okay. Is that sorry? Is that what it says? Uh, structuring and elaboration. Okay, so you want me to elaborate on a SWOT analysis? Sure. Um, my first tip is do a Google search. Um, to, can you do that for us, Jack, now? Can you just bring up a quick Google window and we'll do a quick SWOT analysis um, Google search? So Jack's just going to do a quick Google search for you. And um, let's see how we go. So can you do me, can you do a Google search how to do a SWOT analysis? There you go, it's there. Look at that. Someone searched this before. So don't reinvent the wheel. Google is an amazing tool. There's a whole bunch of images of what SWOT analysis could look like. So go do that Google search. But if you can just click the all tab, let's have a look at all. And so look at that. So what's a, there's a website there. It just says determine the objective, decide on a key project or strategy. So if you read, don't just jump on the first one like Jack did. Um, have a skim through your Google search results, look at the first four or five and see what the common thread is through those four or five pages to get a bit of a sense of a general way of doing SWOT analysis. Um, I can't, I'll, I'll leave this up there because we're going to take a screenshot of it. But if you were to get some, you know, go into a bit of a workshop and you say, well, what are the strengths? You've got to pick a subject area so you can do across the whole organization your SWOT analysis, or you could do subject areas. So if it's your quality system that you're concerned about, your ISO 9001, 2015 quality system, that's talking about risk-based thinking. We're telling people to upgrade to the 2015 version of the standard, which you should be doing in the next couple of months. Like you're at the end of the process. Most people are done already. Do a SWOT analysis on, on your organization. What are your company's or your organization's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? And just with the agenda of the session, Start with strengths, work through that. What are your weaknesses? What are your opportunities? What are your threats? It's just a brainstorming exercise. I ran in my rant earlier about doing it quarterly or six times a year. If you do that, then you're gonna get better at it every time. The quality is gonna improve and you're gonna get some real meaningful results out of it. That's why I recommend doing it more often. Shorter time, more often. Not big things once a year. Short, sweet, practice, get better and better and better. Um, but there's a great Google search. Uh, if you want to have some more of a discussion about that uh, on SWOT analysis, send me a message on LinkedIn and I can message you backwards and forwards and, we, and I, can, um, I can help you a little bit more when we've got more time. Okay, uh, what else? Anyone else? Uh, just post a comment. Um, if you can't see where I'm reading the comments from, there's a comment section on the side of the YouTube stream. If you're watching in from the email, you can click the title above the video here, click the title. That'll take you through to YouTube and you can post comments there or send me a message on LinkedIn. Let me have a quick look. Okay, so send me a message on LinkedIn. I'm gonna open that up just quickly. Okay, so I've got my LinkedIn messaging app open now. So if you'd like to send me a LinkedIn message, then I'll pick that up straight away. Or send me a connection request. Let me just quickly check those. Okay, hello, uh, Alex Kennedy. Um, let me just quickly read that. I just missed it, I think. Alex, okay. Um, okay, Alex, I will send you a copy of Certified. No problems. Thanks for watching. Okay, um, what else have we got? Let me just, you just keep watching that for me, Jack. Um, if there's any questions. So LinkedIn's open. Um, okay, Alex will get you a copy of Certified. Um, what else we got? Uh, so, profit is kind of vague improvement in the terms of the goal. 
<laughs> uh, looks like finance is dependent on the rest of the things, uh, independent factors. Um, yeah, that's correct, mate. The, the, that's definitely, look, um, let me rub this off. So as a CEO, this oh, is... Oh, it doesn't matter. Go, 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 go. I can redraw it. Okay, Jack's getting a picture for everybody. Okay, as the CEO here at Best Practice, my business coach taught me something really important, which I knew, but I, you know, I get help. I've got a great COO, Chief Operating Officer. I've got a great business coach. I've got a great board of directors here at Best Practice that support me. Um, and there's some really simple stuff. Now, profit. We talk about here, the language you use at best practice is guiding principles. So this is your revenue. And it can be your annual revenue, your monthly revenue, your daily revenue, it could be your price, your price objective for, your, um, for what you're doing. Here at best practice, we talk about a target of 20% profit. So when we annualize that for the 2000 and um, 18, 2019, and 2017, 2018 financial years, our target profit is 20%. And I'll tell you right now, we're currently tracking at less than 10. So our actual performance at the moment is more like 9%. And so we're off track with our profit. Our target's 20%. So we're working pretty hard to have a health financially healthy company. Now that's a challenge for me here at Best Practice because we are growing very quickly. Like you guys are all loving everything that we're doing in the marketplace. We're hiring more staff, we're doing more marketing. Like I do this for free. Like I should charge for this. And lots of people saying you should charge for this. This is great content. So here at Best Practice, we have this concept of profit at 20%. That's our target. Our COGS is 30% target. And COGS, is cost of goods sold. Now, I don't take 30% and write that down as a target for your organization. That's for us. The question is, what is your COGS as a percentage? So our GP margin here at Best Practice is this line here and this line here. GP margin, if you like, is 70%. So gross profit margin that we're trying to make. And so at 70%, it include, it takes out COGS. So we've got COGS, cost of goods sold, GP margin, profit at 20%. But the 50% line down here is our overhead costs. Costs. That's our overheads, you know, like our fixed and variable costs. So in here, we've got marketing, sales, um, over here is our operational costs because we're a service-based company. Marketing, sales, finance, OHS, environmental. So I've got 50% of every dollar that I earn is spent running the company. 30 cents in every dollar is delivering the service. That's the target and profit is 20. Now I can tell you that at the moment we're at 9% profit and so that means that this 30% and this 50% which is overheads they're over budget if that makes sense and I've got a lot of work to do to correct the financial health of this organization but it's hard to do when you're growing very very quickly so at the moment our COGS actual is more like 42 to 43% so I've got to get that down you know that's my graph my target is 30%, but at the moment we're tracking along. We're slowly getting it down, but we've got a bit, bit more work to do. And then our overhead costs uh, are, are a little bit high. Now that raised the question for our board last month. They said, you think these targets are right? Are they realistic? And the answer to that question was no. So we're thinking about the targets 30, but we're thinking about revising the target to be 40 here and 40 here. So 40% COGS, 40% overheads to allow us to have our 20% profit. So 40, 40, and 20. So 
I appreciate that my comment earlier about profit was a little bit vague, but yes, that's exactly right. All of your other statistics, all the other things that you're building to give a clear picture of your organization's performance, they're all about helping your organization to survive and be financially healthy. Okay, what else we got? Hello, Lucy. Um, I run KPIs on lost time injury, frequency rate for OHS performance, NCRs for QA, and waste management reports for environment performance. Would you recommend any other? Yes, absolutely. Lucy, so lost time, let me quickly talk about Lucy. You've got lost time injury, frequency rate, you have got NCRs for QA, and you've got environmental perform waste management for environmental performance. If I was a, so from a, from a staff member's perspective, your lost time injury frequency rate is, the, is, for everybody else, is the time that people are off work on injuries or the amount of time lost. How do you prevent injuries? You do hazard identification, inspections, preventative activities. So Lucy, more valuable things to collect would be the number of inspections or the number of hazard reports encouraging your small company to be identifying things that could go wrong identifying like have a think about what is what are the things that you guys do in your organization that could cause an injury or cause a lost time injury and look at tracking those numbers i can honestly say that if you have a safety focused team that are looking at hazards and fixing things Tracking the number of safety things fixed per week would be a better statistic than the lost time injury frequency rate because we've got this safety focused fixed things culture. Does that make sense? And so that would be more important. And call it, like have some fun with it Lucy. Call it number of safety things fixed per week and everyone have a laugh and it'll be like a positive bit of a fun culture to it. And that's what we do here at Best Practice. Like, you know, let's let's call things crazy names. And I heard someone calling. Um, um, they were talk, they were talking about their NCRs. And I was in a meeting on Friday. They were talking about their NCRs, so quality. They were calling them breakfast issues because someone called it a someone mispronounced best practice review or best practice assessment because they didn't want to call them internal audits. And they said breakfast. So they said breakfast reviews. So they call their QA issues breakfast reviews. But from a QA perspective. Non-conformances are when things have happened. It's a lag indicator. So your customer with your QA statistic in your small company, what are the important things for your customer? And in a small company, this is more important. So asking your customer, what is it that they really desire from you? What's on your wish list? So then what could you internally manage or measure, what could you internally measure around that? So Lucy, maybe you could quickly post a comment for me and tell me what sort of company you're in and I can give you uh, 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 some statistics that are gonna help you. So I'll see that I'm about four or five seconds ahead of you in my presentation. So I'll wait for that comment to come up while I talk about environmental ones. So Lucy, if you wouldn't mind posting the industry that you're in, um, so then then that I'll watch for that comment to come up on, uh, on my dashboard there. So, um, so Lucy, with tracking waste management, uh, per, uh, construction, perfect. Okay, so for construction, the uh, program. So not, not non-conformances or defects. Of course, defects are very important. So defects of the project or the work that you're doing are very important. What could you do to prevent that? So, so with defects that you identify the defect before the customer does, it's very important. But in construction, is your program on time? So the project that you're doing, what are you tracking to ensure that you deliver the project on time? What, what inspections or checks do you do in the process before you get a non-conformance? Like I appreciate your non-conformances you're reporting might be through the process, but what sorts of things do you do together with your contractors and together with your staff to be checking that things are being done correctly before a mistake is made, if that makes sense. So supervision, communication, those sorts of things. So, so pre-start meetings or, or, um, or the word we were using was um, um, like a handover meeting with your contractor or a, like a, a startup meeting with your contractor and good quality communication might mean that you're going to prevent those mistakes happening instead of your NCRs and your construction projects. So I'm not sure how big your organization is, but I have seen success with 
like like higher quality communication, like a site manager talks to the contractors three times a day, when the site manager only talks to the contractors once a week, they have more non-conformances. So equally, rather than me solving your problem, asking your site managers, asking the people that manage the area of the business where that non-conformance happened, you as a leader, your management system represent, you're the management system representative in your organization. You as a leader engaging with your team and engaging with the people that are in those areas of business and saying, what sorts of things could we do to prevent this non-conformance? And how often should we measure that? What would we measure to keep track of ourselves? Are we doing those things so we don't get those non-conformances? So I have found that being a better leader is about asking great questions. And, and that would be, you know, the standards talk about um, engagement of people and asking those people those questions to get those lead indicators, you're gonna be far more influential rather than trying to solve the problems. And you're probably saying, there, yeah, that could work, that won't work, that could work. So I do appreciate the fact that asking some questions. Uh, Lucy, just to quickly talk about your environmental performance um, uh, with construction, it could be uh, percentage of waste to landfill. So I think you're talking about, uh, well, you've got waste management reports. Um, what about, um, in percentage of environmentally sustainable products specified into the project. So one thing that is really interesting about um, this office and these office fit outs that we work in is that if somebody new moves into this space, they'll just collapse this office fit out and all these walls and windows and everything, put them in a skip bin, take it to landfill and build something new. And so I always ask the question, what could be specified for the customer to make the asset that you're constructing more environmentally sustainable in the future. So how could you save, how could you help your customer save money on maintaining their asset that you're building in the future? The future use of the, of the, um, of the thing that you're building. So whether you're construction, I'm thinking pipelines, utility, buildings, offices, houses, dams, wharves, all the things I've been on construction sites in the past. And it's a really good question to say, how could we help our customer be more environmentally sustainable in the future with their asset that they're building? It's a challenging question. It's a big hill to climb, but it is really important. And that will set yourselves apart from your competitors, which is really, in, which is really interesting. So Lucy, I hope, I hope that helped. Um, okay, so um, upgrading of benchmarks of KPI is one of the essential ways of profit enhancements. Absolutely, that's exactly right. As you get more confident um, in improving your statistics and improving your tracking, yes, of course, uh, improving your goals. Not, it's not about constantly moving the goalposts in, in your organization, but getting more refined on what your targets should be. And that's what happened here with us. 12 months ago, we said, you know, 20, 30, 4, 50, and just recently we've changed that um, because we, you know, it's, it's unrealistic. We talk about objectives being SMART, S-M-A-R-T. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. And we found that 30% COGS wasn't realistic for us. 40% is realistic that we can achieve that. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, thanks for watching. There's uh, on um, that side, what side is it on? Yeah, that side over there, those are our certificates. So um, the ISO certification side of the business. So I love connecting with people on LinkedIn. I love messaging backwards and forwards on the email system on LinkedIn. It's a great way to get me because I've got my phone in my hand all the time. So thanks for watching. We've gone a bit over time. I hope this was your best webinar ever, ever, and you had a lot of fun and you got some great information. And I will see you guys soon somewhere on YouTube, here at Best Practice TV, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever it might be. Thanks for watching and I look forward to getting your feedback uh, on that request I've got. So uh, thanks everybody. I will see you all soon.